Okay, we can um, go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone so much for being here. Um, my name is Maya Singh, and I am going to be giving you all the rundown on unlocking systems insights, leveraging eBPF for data collection. This talk is going to feature a open source project called Inspector Gadget. Uh, Inspector Gadget is a CNCF uh, sandbox project that we're really excited to uh, tell you a little bit about. Um, before we get started, yeah, thank you all for being here, and I would love to give a round of applause to our volunteers and everyone who's helping make this uh, conference possible, and everyone with, I had a lot of AV uh, help earlier today, so yeah, round of applause for those folks, thank you. Um, and yeah, let's get started. So a little bit about me, I'm actually originally from Rochester, New York, so really excited that Flock was here this year. I'm a product manager at Microsoft, and pictured here are a couple of my teammates. Mauricio is our technical lead, and Chris is our technical product manager. Some of the slides you see today are reworked from their previous presentation, so wanted to give them a shout out. They're uh, amazing coworkers and colleagues to work with, so um, yeah, just wanted to shout them out. Okay. Alrighty, so a few goals for today. It would be great if by the end of this presentation you all have a high level understanding of eBPF and its superpowers. And we hope that you'll learn about Inspector Gadget and how it supercharges eBPF. And hopefully you have fun and are engaged during the talk and enjoy learning about these things. Here's our agenda for the presentation, starting out with the introduction, we're already uh, on our way there. We'll dive into what is eBPF, we'll talk about what is Inspector Gadget, why Inspector Gadget even exists, how you can leverage it, and then what's next for the project. So we're really excited that we're very, very close to landing all of the core functionality for Inspector Gadget. We recently had a sort of big release um, this week to land a lot of the core concepts for the project. That said, it is still under active development. There's some features that are still in progress and they'll stabilize over the next few releases and months. So I just wanted to mention that at the beginning of the talk so that you all have that uh, awareness. And all that said, if you decide you wanna explore Inspector Gadget and learn more about the project, we welcome your feedback on the functionality and the user experience. So um, yeah, we're more than happy to Hear your all's feedback. Uh, I think it'll be really helpful to improving the project. Um, cool. So the next portion of the presentation is kind of uh, interactive. If you all use Menti before, if you'd like to, you can um, take your phones out and go to menti.com and then type in this code and it will bring up a poll for you all, hopefully. Um, I'm gonna try it with you. And I will drag this over, see if you can see. The code is at the top, it's uh, 83101006. And so what you can do is, I'm interested in hearing what you all think as it relates to eBPF, just to sort of set, set the stage and understand where people are in their eBPF journey. So you can use this, uh, please keep it work appropriate, um, to put, your, your responses will hopefully show up here. Okay, it's working. Thanks for playing along. This is, it's fun to, see where people's heads are at when it comes to a topic that can be pretty unfamiliar to folks. So yeah, tracing, Linux, networking, technical packets, this is great, yeah. That's awesome. Not just packet filtering, yeah, we'll get into that as well. Tracing, instrumentation, awesome. Thanks, uh, yeah, thanks for 
uh, answering that one. I have uh, one more question for you all as well. Um, let's see, it's just gonna load for us. Yeah, just out of curiosity, do you use eBPS today? Yeah, a lot of kind of, maybe you're using tools that leverage eBPS, maybe it's somewhere under the hood um, of things that you're using, a lot of no, one yes. This is great, yeah, thanks for, thanks for sharing. Awesome. Cool. A health level set so that um, I can have a sense as to where people are in their journeys, I think this, um, high level overview of eBPF and Inspector Gadget will be a good uh, place for us to start. Okay, and yeah, so I'm from Rochester, so I had to include a garbage pl plate reference. What do eBPF and garbage plates have in common? Um, you're probably thinking nothing, and the <laughs> truth is very, very little, but in my mind, they're confusing at first, but once you dig into them and understand what makes them great, it makes sense why people love them. So. In regards to eBPF, I hope by the end of this presentation, you'll understand what makes eBPF great. And regarding garbage plates, we can talk after the talk. Uh, I have a lot more to say about that, so. Cool, okay, so what is eBPF? Technically, it stands for Extended Berkeley Packet Filter, but its applications are well beyond packet filtering. So um, while its acronym refers to packet filtering, it actually has applications well beyond that. So eBPF technically is in-kernel bytecode runtime used for tracing, security, networking, as many of you all mentioned in the word cloud, but what does this even mean? Um, eBPF allows for programs to be safely executed in the kernel. Since the kernel is such a sensitive space and controls so much in terms of writing to files, allocating memory, networking, as you all mentioned, um, we want to understand and even change what's happening in there in a safe and performant manner. So what's cool about eBPF is that it brings flexibility to the kernel and that you can actually change what's happening in the kernel without having to um, talk to the maintainers of the kernel, uh, try to get a patch in, and then it might be you know years before uh, the kernel version is actually used in production. Using eBPF, you can make changes to the kernel and it really does bring that flexibility to the Linux kernel. Additionally, um, there is very little strain on the system from a performance perspective as it relates to eBPF. It uses a um, just-in-time compiler, so that helps contribute to its performance, which is another huge plus of eBPF. And finally, it won't crash your kernel. It runs through a verifier, and that ensures that whatever eBPF code that you're writing, the programs that you're running, aren't going to crash the kernel. And I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the applications and use cases of eBPF, at least for me, that's how I learn the best, is actually thinking through examples and use cases, and throughout the presentation, I tried to inject as many use cases and, um, real life practical examples in the presentation so that you guys kind of like can make connections to the sort of real world um, applications of eBPF. So we talked a little bit about these things, I'll give some more examples, but for tracing, eBPF can be used to measure CPU usage, memory allocation, and similar metrics which can be used for performance troubleshooting. What's cool is that the Android operating system actually uses eBPF to um, measure CPU usage for applications that are um, running on Android. So a lot of you said you use uh, eBPF kind of, maybe you have an Android phone and you're using eBPF and didn't even know it. Um, another application, as we mentioned before, is security. So eBPF can be used to enforce control policies and you can whitelist and blacklist 
specific system calls. So system calls are those that are made from the user space to the kernel. And if you want to sort of minimize the attack surface as it relates to those system calls, you can write policies to ensure that that attack surface is minimized and you're only uh, allowing the exact system calls that are necessary for whatever program you're trying to execute. And another one that you, uh, many of you mentioned in the um, word cloud is networking. So eBPF allows for packet filtering within and modification within the Linux kernel. So when you're thinking about firewalls um, and that sort of thing, you can create firewall rules to drop uh, packets based on a specific condition, like maybe there is a malicious traffic or that sort of thing, you can write an eBPF program to ensure that sort of traffic does not uh, make it through to the system. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about some eBPF related concepts just so you guys have a little bit, like it's, it's gonna be pretty high level, but um, I'll talk a little bit about eBPF hooks first. So. In terms of the technology, eBPF is event driven and the way it works is that there are uh, events that we call hooks that, the, that essentially trigger these eBPF programs. So um, any time this particular event happens, uh, the eBPF program will run and we, yeah, we call these events hooks and there are many different types of hooks, I'll just like, share a few, but these, this is just a subset of the types of hooks that exist. But one of the common ones that you might hear is called k-probes. So these are triggered when a function in the kernel occurs, um, like an exec uh, VE syscall, for example, which is used for executing new programs. That's a type of k-probe that exists. Another type of um, hook, that eBPF hook that exists is also for networking, we have network devices. So if there's a networking uh, event that you'd like to trigger an eBPF event, that's another type of hook and uh, will trigger your eBPF related to networking. Another concept I wanted to share with you all is this idea of eBPF maps. So this is where the eBPF program sends data for then the application layer to extract essentially. So the application layer uses what's called BPF syscall to take the information that is being stored in the eBPF map and send it to the application layer. And yeah, it's essentially the intermediary between the eBPF program and the application layer. So yeah, just to, just to like tie this all in, basically when the hooks occur, when these events that trigger the eBPF programs happen, it sends data to the eBPF map, and from there the application layer can use BPF syscall to extract that data. Okay, so now you know a little bit about sort of eBPF superpowers. It brings flexibility to the kernel. It's low, for, uh, low strain from a performance perspective and it also is a safe way to access the kernel. But it's not without its challenges. It does have a pretty steep learning curve and requires a low, a deep level of low level systems troubleshooting. And with that, it also, it's really powerful in understanding the kernel, right? There's a lot we can extract from the kernel, but there's very limited higher level context in terms of the system as a whole and having a comprehensive view of uh, your entire stack, especially, we'll get into it, but if you're using containers and Kubernetes, it doesn't necessarily have that visibility into those higher level concepts. So it does have a lot of superpowers, but it's not without its challenges. So yeah, we did a little quick overview, high level overview of eBPF. We know that it ex executes in the kernel, it brings a lot of power to the kernel via these hooks, these eBPF hooks, and via the eBPF maps as well. But when it comes to the user space, um, 
it's kind of like we are at this place where we're like, okay, we have all this information. What do we do with it, right? How do we use this? How does someone who is working in the user space, maybe at the application layer, actually make use of this very granular data that eBPF is able to surface? And that is where Inspector Gadget comes into play. So um, we are trying to not only make eBPF more accessible to everyone, but also give it that higher level context in the user space. Okay, so let's dive into what Inspector Gadget really is. So Inspector Gadget is a tool, it's a set of tools that we call gadgets, hence the name Inspector Gadget, that empower users to inspect the Linux kernel and Kubernetes systems using eBPF programs in an accessible way. Just out of uh, like a show of hands, are people using Kubernetes? Okay, a little bit. Um, and it is also a framework. So I'll get into the framework a little bit later on in the presentation, but our vision is that it truly is a way which eBPF developers can easily build, package, deploy, and run gadgets in a very modular way. And then finally, it's a community. What I think is really cool about Inspector Gadget is that it's really bridging the gap between highly, highly technical eBPF experts and sort of the everyday developer who knows the importance of having visibility into the Linux kernel, but um, you know wants a little bit of an easier way to get that uh, information. Okay, cool. So if you remember the previous uh, version of this graph, I kind of had a big question mark on the right hand side uh, indicating like, what do we do in the user space and alluded to that, oh, that's where Inspector Gadget comes into play. And Inspector Gadget it basically is taking care of a lot of things in the user space to make the Linux kernel level data more accessible and easier to understand in the context of the entire system. So what Inspector Gadget is doing behind the scenes is it's enriching the data to include those higher level concepts like containers and Kubernetes, filtering the data so that we only show the most important um, data points and metrics for you all, user space processing, this is all happening in the user space, and we're also working on a variety of ways to export the data. I, I'll get into it in a little bit, but in terms of Prometheus, open telemetry, all of that stuff, we wanna make it really easy for people to get this very valuable data and export it to wherever you may need it to be. And similarly, like I mentioned earlier, we also want to make these gadgets very easily shareable and distributable as well. So there are also several modes of use, which I'll get into in a second as well. But hopefully this diagram at a high level shows you that like, hey, we used to have a question mark in the user space. What do we do with this super granular data? Um, and now Inspector Gadget is helping make some sense out of this uh, kernel level data. Okay, so about the enrichment and filtering, like I've been mentioning this whole time, the eBPF data is very granular and has limited higher level context, but what Inspector Gadget does is it enriches and adds that higher level data. So basically we have Kubernetes pods, we have containers, uh, doesn't have to be in the context of Kubernetes, domain names and the IP addresses from services, container information, and like I mentioned earlier as well, there is that um, event filtering piece as well where we're showing a subset of events from selected containers and um, pods and you, you all um, can even filter to which particular uh, pods or containers you want to look at. And there is also some filtering that happens at the eBPF gadget layer as well to make sure that we're working in a performant manner. EBPF itself is already pretty performant, but um, doing some extra, extra filtering within the kernel uh, even takes that to the next level so that the user space data is uh, rich, but um, what is necessary. Okay, cool. So I want to dig into a little bit of like, what is a gadget? We've been talking about gadgets or EBPF programs, like, 
you know, they supercharge EBVF kind of. Um, but what is it exactly? When we d d deconstruct it, what makes a gadget a gadget? And what a gadget is, is an OCI image that contains uh, three components. Of course, the EBPF program is the big thing of, that's the uh, bread and butter that makes up uh, the core functionality of the gadget. Uh, we also include a metadata file so that users have information about the gadget, its capabilities, the output formatting, build information as well. And there's the option to include a user space module for any post-processing of the e eBPF data that one might want. Um, and we can use a WASM file for that. And as we look towards the future of a gadget, we really want it to be a one-stop shop. So we're looking to include the documentation, logos perhaps, source code, all of that good stuff within the gadget itself. I kind of alluded to this idea of like making gadgets easy to share and use within the community. And basically we could have essentially like we use the OCI registry, what your registry of choice as almost a marketplace for these gadgets, for these OCI images to live. And we are using the uh, open source project Auras to help with this functionality. But basically the idea is that you could have a lot of gadgets that live in a container registry, um, like GitHub container registry, and it acts as a marketplace for these supercharged eBPF programs that we're calling gadgets. And you can share and build an ecosystem where gadgets can be tweaked or enhanced to meet particular needs. So you could pull, like today even, if there's a gadget that you see in Inspector Gadget that you think is interesting but doesn't quite fit your needs, you could pull that down from the container registry, make some tweaks, and then push it back so that someone else could use your version of a gadget, which I think is pretty cool in terms of like the community aspect of this and really, uh, yeah, bridging the gap and bringing people together to share, create, and then tweak gadgets. I'm not gonna read through all of these, but the Inspector Gadget team has worked really hard to create a sort of library of official gadgets. Um, on this page, you can see the different categories of gadgets that we've created. These are the really just the tip of the iceberg, in my opinion, uh, as it relates to the capabilities of eBPF and the scope of the gadgets that could exist. Um, we're really focusing on observability and troubleshooting, and you can see that there are um, different types of gadgets that help with this, whether it's profiling, um, block input output, CPU usage, um, there's also a bunch of trace gadgets that uh, trace and print system events like DNS, uh, exec, out of memory kill, that sort of thing. So there is a very uh, wide variety, but still I, I'm, like, I really think there's, we could go even further and deeper and I think there's a lot of potential when it comes to gadgets, but this is all just to give you guys an idea of what kind of gadgets exist and um, essentially if there's anything that like piques your interest, you could uh, check it out and have a little bit of context as to um, what the different types of gadgets are that exist. I'll dig into three of them to give you some more practical examples. The first one I'll talk about is trace DNS. So trace DNS prints information about DNS queries and responses sent and received by different pods. So basically in the trace DNS gadget, you can see the different DNS queries. You can see um, a response code. So if there are any errors, you'll be able to see that within the output of the trace DNS gadget. And even if there's not an error, if there's uh, no error returned in your response code um, column. You can even see latency that might be happening as well. So we have a um, query response latency field as well. So if you're seeing any latency on your application layer or any issues there, a really common issue oftentimes is DNS. So the trace DNS gadget is uh, pretty helpful. I think a 
especially in the context of Kubernetes clusters. If you, for those of you who are using Kubernetes, we find that Trace DNS comes in really helpful. The another, another gadget that I'll uh, talk about is Top Block IO. So this is used to visualize containers with the most block device input output. So we can basically just print out a list of the block IO activity and it will uh, help you see if there's any sort of anomaly in any of your containers as it relates to block IO. And advise SACOMP profile gadget I think is really cool. Basically the way it works is um, this is for secure computing mode um, profiles, but what the gadget does is you run the gadget, you then run the processes that you want to occur on your system, and then you stop the gadget, and the gadget will recommend a SACOMP profile for you all, for you based on the activity that it's just observed so that you can really limit the system calls that are happening from the application layer to the kernel to really uh, have the minimum amount of like attack area between the user space and the kernel. So I think I think that's really cool. I was like, oh yeah, we can scan the process that's happening and sort of generate this recommendation as to what is sort of the minimum amount of uh, service area needed to achieve what you want to achieve, but also keep bad actors out. So I kind of I kind of like that one. Um, and I'll do a demo of a few more, but just wanted to like describe these um, to you all. Um, but in a little bit, I'll actually show you how it works in the command line. Okay, so before we get to that, I want to just give a little bit of background around why Inspector Gadget. I hope um, you kind of un understand like the core concept and why it exists, but I'll give some history as well. Basically, Inspector Gadget started in 2019 and initially, it wanted to bring eBPF and BCC tools to Kubernetes. So for context, BCC is a toolkit that makes writing eBPF programs easier. It's sort of, it was one of the earlier uh, projects that made eBPF a little more accessible. And the team had this idea that like, hey, we should bring this uh, to Kubernetes. So yeah, initially Inspector Gadget was for Kubernetes only but now it supports the Linux host directly with the IG uh, CLI tool and of course Kubernetes, we have a kubectl gadget plugin which I think is really cool as well. And through this process of sort of building out a, a project that we wanted to apply to a lot of different places and you, you guys have seen the different types of gadgets, we the team discovered that we had essentially built a framework that we wanted to be able to plug and play into. So at towards the end of the presentation when I talk about what nec what's next, I'll show kind of the pieces that we want to be able to plug and play into, but we know that we want Inspector Gadget to be able to work for its users and with that comes modularity and this this ability to customize the pieces of the puzzle, so we're definitely prioritizing that functionality as we continue to build out the project. Okay, cool. And why Inspector Gadget Part 2? We've kind of, um, you know, said this a bunch, but eBPF is an extremely powerful tool for gathering system information, but it's hard. Like, it's technically and intuitively difficult, and once you have the data, it's still not clear exactly what you would want to do with this very granular kernel level data. And we really wanted to make sure that people had a way to ha have this valuable kernel data be useful to them. If we wanted to do this uh, sort of manually or a uh, Frankenstein type of model, it would take a lot of tooling to do this. You would need perhaps a tool to manage the eBPF programs, this idea of mapping the kernel data to higher level resources, that's sort of the enriching that we spoke about earlier, that would take a additional tooling, the user pr space processing is additional tooling, and even that exporting functionality is additional tooling. So 
the good thing about Inspector Gadget and what we're trying to achieve, and I think we, we're like pretty much there, is being able to bundle all of this together and make it super easy for anyone to leverage the superpowers of eBPF. Okay, as promised, some more use cases for you all. I wanted to give you all some real life use cases of how some folks are using Inspector Gadget. Um, there is an open source project by Armo called Cubescape, and they are using um, Inspector Gadget to enhance and detect uh, vulnerab or to enhance detecting vulnerabilities in containers. So they have a container vulnerability scanning tool, and they use Inspector Gadget to hook into different eBPF events. To specifically, what they're looking at is looking at understanding which files are being opened in each of the workloads that are running on a Kubernetes cluster, which is a cool application. And we'll, um, in the demo, I'll uh, demo some of one of our file related um, gadgets. We're a VM and we are pulling down the most recent version of Inspector Gadget from GitHub. Um, when we do this, we want to make sure the file is good to go and there's uh, no corruption. So we're just like confirming that that is ready to go. And we will then install uh, Inspector Gadget on the VM. So that's what we're doing right here. Cool, looks like it's good to go. What we're going to do now is we are going to run the, let's see, give it a second. Yeah, we're going to run the trace exec gadget using IG trace exec. And what you'll see here below is we're standing up a Docker container. And now we are installing Git on the container. Cool, so now, <laughs> now that we um, have installed Git on the container, you can see, I want us to like look at the output of the trace exec gadget. And what you can see here is basically, you can see exactly the name of the container in which we were installing uh, Git onto. And you can see really what is happening under the hood when we're installing Git. You can see the commands and the parent commands, so you can actually see the order of the events and which parent commands are calling which particular commands, and you can follow the flow of what is happening as Git is being installed. And also, you can see um, if there are any errors in the return column, so there, it looks like there was an error uh, when uh, Git was being installed, but I believe the package manager had some checks uh, built in that enabled uh, Git to be installed successfully. So through this trace exec gadget, you can really understand what's happening at the kernel level under the hood when you are installing or running processes on your container, and you can see where there are errors, you can even see um, monitor for any malicious behavior in this way. So there's a lot, just having, even having visibility into what is going on under the hood can really bring a lot of light and insights into how your processes are running. And I think it's a good, it's sort of like a good baseline gadget to understand like, hey, when I am installing Git on my container, what is happening exactly? Um, there's a lot of power, I think, in this additional visibility that you wouldn't have otherwise. Okay. The next gadget that we're going to demo is called Top File. And this gadget, we are able to sort by in descending order of written bytes. And we'll be able to see uh, file activity with this um, particular gadget. OK, I'm going to pause it here so we can see the output of the Top File gadget. This, we're using the same container as last time, and what we're doing is we're writing foo to the file bar, 
And in the output of the gadget, you're able to see again, like what's going on behind the scenes. So in this first row, you can see this is the command line history. So it's writing, um, you know, the typing that was happening in the command line, it's writing that to the history file. And you can see um, there are 15 bytes that were written to the history file with that uh, command line history. And then the second line here is actually the writing of foo to the file bar that's uh, Four, four bytes that were written to that file. So um, you have some visibility into when you're writing to a file, what exactly is happening. And you'll see uh, the next part of the demo is I think somewhat the more powerful part. So we'll keep going, keep this running. So in this next part of the demo, we're standing up another Docker container. And what we're going to do is we're going to use that container to put some stress on the hard disk drive to really demonstrate um, the power of the top file gadget. So yeah, let me pause it here. So in this particular, um, when we're putting stress onto the hard disk drive, how it's doing that is by writing to these files and it's writing a lot of data to these files. And what is cool is you can see exactly how much is being written to which files. So you're able to have visibility into, like in this case, we're intentionally stressing the hard disk drive, right? But you might have a program that's running in the background or that you don't necessarily Maybe you don't even know it's running and it's putting some stress on your hard disk drive, especially if there's like, you know, a malicious actor. Hopefully that wouldn't happen. But um, some of, yeah, they oftentimes write to files as well. Um, so this gives you visibility into that. Um, and I will just continue the demo to show you the last piece of this then. So this last piece, what, I, what we're trying to demonstrate here is like in the last, in this last, very last part of the demo, we are writing, again, we're writing foo to the file bar in our original container. So here you're able to distinguish between containers as to the activity that is happening within your system at a container level, which I think is really uh, important because if you're seeing, maybe you're seeing some latency at your application layer and you don't really know where it's coming from necessarily, you can use this top file gadget, run it and have visibility into everything that's happening on your system and figure out, oh, hey, actually the busy Rosalind container is the one that's putting stress on, on my system, perhaps causing that latency causing issues with the hard disk drive and investigate from there. So this is sort of this, uh, the beauty of having that kernel level data and mapping it to these higher level concepts because many people who use Inspector Gadget, who use containers, Kubernetes, et cetera, um, they don't necessarily have visibility into what's happening under the hood, but um, Gadgets like trace exec and top file give you that visibility. Um, I should also mention these gadgets can be used on the Linux host directly as well. Um, all you have to use is the, there's like a dash dash host uh, flag that you can enable and you're able to, I, this is, this demo is in the context of containers, but you can run it on the Linux host directly as well. Cool, I think we're doing well on time. I'll talk a little bit about what is next. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that I, I'm trying to give you all visibility into what an operator-based framework, this modular framework to make that super customizable could look like. These are sort of the components that we want everyone to be able to plug and play into and uh, tweak to meet their own needs. So uh, we talked a little about oh, the, co the container registries, you know, you should be able to, you, you can use any container registry that works for you. The gadget itself has a lot of modularity built into it, whether it's the EVPF program, the metadata, the WASM file, all of these things we want, they are plug and play today and easily changed and tweaked. 
the data enrichment and filtering is something that should also be customizable, and it is, it is definitely today. And then the data export, Prometheus, OpenTelemetry, JSON file, whatever you would like to use, that is also plug and play. And then the different modes of operations being on, on the Linux host or in uh, Kubernetes using containers. Um, all of this is super customizable and we want it to be able to work for any specific use case or needs that people have. Okay, so what's next? We want to be able to support a declarative way to run gadgets via a uh, configuration file, for example. Uh, the team is almost done with that, which I think is exciting. Spoke a little bit about the various export options, OpenTelemetry, for example, Golang API, which I am really excited about. Um, really understanding the community's priorities as well as like very high on our list. And then chaos, not chaos on the team, but chaos engineering. I'm really excited about that one. There's an opportunity to use, uh, to build a gadget to essentially put some, uh, inject some faults into the system uh, for, from a KS engineering perspective. And we actually uh, have a Linux Foundation mentorship program, like a little side project where hopefully a mentee will look into creating some chaos for us and uh, proper documentation for all of this. So that is a little bit about what's next. And here is my little call to action. If hopefully some of these use cases that I shared may have triggered some ideas for you all and you can think about how eBPF could be used to, on the projects that you all are working on and see if uh, we have a gadget that could help you. Um, and yeah, thank you. Here's some information about Inspector Gadget as well. I have stickers also. That's a reminder more for me than for you guys. But yeah, thank you and uh, happy to take some questions. I'll try my best with the questions. <laughs> Is there a way to get structured output from the uh, various gadgets rather than be nice, pretty formatted? Were you saying, is there a structured? Yeah. JSON, YAML, other IDEA? Yeah, at this point, it's uh, JSON is the main thing that we're using to output the gadgets, but the other things should be an op. It should be easy to make those other sort of structured outputs as well. Yeah. And it is in that, is, were you asking like in the columns? So that I can redirect with the syslog as one nasty unholy line that I can then filter with fluent and all of those things. Oh, you, you want to do that? Yeah. I okay. <laughs> I have terrible ideas. I think, ideas. yes, we can, we can do that for you. I, I feel like that would, be, that would be easy. You could tweak the uh, output formatting to be like that for sure. I think that would be easy. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Please take the stickers. Please. Thank you, Neil. So nice. Oprah over here. Thank you. The other people who are who have been actively using it. Yeah, so the Armo team in particular is super active in terms of their contribution to the project and um, yeah, outside of that, it's mostly the maintainers from our team. The projects, I would say, still early on. And then, yeah, we would love contributions from anyone, of course, even if it's just opening an issue of something that you're interested in. But yeah, the reality is, is Armo are big contributors. The internal Microsoft Defender team has been awesome partners for us as well. But almost all of the development is coming from the maintainers and the Microsoft team at this point. Yeah. 
Um, about the Amazon EKS integrations, is that something that's enabled by default or like? No, no not by default. But you know people are using it. Yes. Okay, I gotcha, yeah, gotcha. yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Cool. Awesome. Thank you, everyone.